This video is made possible by Nebula. Use the link down in the description below to support Real Life Lore directly by signing up, where you can watch 27 additional and exclusive full-length videos in my ongoing Nebula Modern Conflict series, covering recent major wars and crises, including this video's next part covering the biggest battle fought in Europe since the Second World War, the Battle of Bakhmut. In late June of 2023, a seemingly earth-shattering event of enormous historic significance took place within Russia that briefly captured the entire world's attention. The Wagner Group, a Russian government-funded private military company with as many as 50,000 mercenaries under its control, led by Yevgeny Prigozhin, suddenly launched a full-scale armed rebellion against the Russian government. For over a year beforehand, the Wagner Group had been fighting for the Russians on the front lines in Ukraine and suffered very heavy casualties in the months-long battle for the town of Bakhmut, in which the organization's leader, Prigozhin, claimed to have suffered 20,000 of his mercenaries killed in action. Prigozhin frequently criticized how the Russian military leadership was ineffectually carrying out the war in Ukraine, and repeatedly called out the Russian defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, and the Russian chief of the general staff, Valery Gerasimov, for incompetence. Prigozhin consistently asserted that the Russian military was undersupplying his Wagner Group with ammunition and retreating from areas of the front line without informing him, often leaving the Wagner Group's flanks exposed to Ukrainian counterattacks in the process. The rising tension between the professional Russian army and the mercenary Wagner Group finally exploded late on the 23rd of June 2023, when Prigozhin claimed, with very shaky evidence, that the Russian military had allegedly attacked his own troops with missiles that allegedly killed 2,000 of his mercenaries. Then, declaring himself and the Wagner Group an armed rebellion, Prigozhin demanded that both Shoigu and Gerasimov be personally handed over to him to face his own justice or else, and led around 20,000 of his mercenaries away from the front line in Ukraine storming back across the border into Russia proper, where they quickly seized control over the major city of Rostov-on-Don, with a population of about 1.2 million people. And from there, the entire world watched on over the next several hours to see what would happen next. As the armed columns of mercenaries thundered in their tanks and trucks, northwards along the M4 highway seemingly unopposed, straight for Moscow. Along their way, they also seized control over the major Russian city of Voronezh, home to about 1.1 million people, while Vladimir Putin himself made a televised address to the nation, declaring that Prigozhin and the Wagner Group were treasonous traitors, and that they would all be ruthlessly destroyed. Military defenses and barricades were being hastily prepared around Moscow to protect the capital, just as military helicopters attempted to attack the Wagner convoys on the highway but kept getting shot down by them. It seemed nearly inevitable that the Russian Federation was catapulting head first into full-blown civil war. But nearly just as quickly as it all began, it all came to a close. Only a little more than 24 hours after launching the rebellion, Prigozhin suddenly backed down after revealing that the dictator of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, a man closely allied to the Kremlin, had quietly stepped in behind the scenes to negotiate some kind of compromise. The Wagner Group laid down their arms, withdrew from their briefly occupied cities of Voronezh and Rostov-on-Don, all criminal charges of treason were dropped, and Prigozhin and much of the Wagner Group establishment allegedly went into exile in Belarus. The 24 hours of chaos that led to that conclusion left a few dozen Russian soldiers and mercenaries killed and wounded, and a few destroyed vehicles. It represented the first major armed rebellion against central authority within the Russian Federation since the constitutional crisis of 1993 that happened 30 years previously, which had involved then-President Boris Yeltsin launching a self-coup against the Russian parliament that climaxed with Russian tanks in Moscow under Yeltsin's direct orders shelling the House of the Soviets in Moscow, a series of events that killed and wounded hundreds and left many outside observers similarly speculating that Russia was on the brink of a full-blown civil war. But that's not what ended up happening in 1993, and it's not what ended up happening in 2023 either. Nonetheless, many videos, publications, and articles have been produced about the 24-hour Wagner Rebellion, asserting that this was only the beginning of the end for Vladimir Putin's regime in Moscow, and that more chaos and rebellions to come are certain. Many have even gone so far as to suggest that the costly war in Ukraine and its consequences will lead to the supposedly inevitable dissolution of the Russian Federation itself. Just like how the costly war in Afghanistan contributed to the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and how the costly experience in World War I led to the dissolution of the Tsarist Russian Empire before it. 
But the thing you've got to understand is that these predictions of Putin's inevitable collapse in the Kremlin have been being produced for a very, very long time, for about as long as Putin himself has been in power. There were the pieces created pronouncing the end was nigh for Putin after the humiliatingly successful Ukrainian counteroffensives in 2022 around Kharkiv and Kherson that saw the Russians losing more than 13,000 square kilometers of occupied Ukrainian territory. There have consistently been almost countless pieces produced speculating about Putin's health and suggesting that he might literally die at any moment. There were countless more pieces pronouncing that Putin was finished and doomed to lose in Ukraine immediately after the invasion began back in February of 2022 egged on by the emergence of tens of thousands of protesters taking to the streets against the war across major Russian cities. Before that, there were all the pieces produced about the inevitable coming end of Putin over the Russian government's gross mishandling of the COVID-19 pandemic, in which, depending on who you ask, anywhere between 400,000 and 820,000 Russians died resulting in the biggest peacetime loss of life in all of Russia's contemporary history. Before that, there were those who predicted the end of Putin following the surprise election of Volodymyr Zelensky to the presidency of Ukraine in 2019. And before that, there were those who predicted the end of Putin in 2018 over the government pushing ahead of extremely unpopular pension reforms that raised the age of retirement in the country by five years. And before that, there were those who predicted that the rising political star of Alexei Navalny within Russia would lead to the eventual downfall of Putin. And before that, there there were those who predicted that Russia's annexation of Crimea from Ukraine, the war in Donbass, and the ensuing Western financial sanctions after 2014 would lead to Putin's undoing. And before that, there were the anti-government and anti-Putin protests in 2011 and 2012 that were supposedly the beginning of the end for Putin. And before that, it was Russia's invasion of Georgia, the 2009 global financial crisis and the cratering of global oil prices that were supposedly all the beginning of Putin's end. And before that, it was the inept and bungled Russian government responses to terror attacks in 2004 and 2002 during the Beslan school siege and the Moscow theater hostage crisis that spelled the inevitable doom for Putin's regime. As you can see, people have basically been predicting the end of Vladimir Putin's regime in Moscow for pretty much the entirety of the past 23 years, ever since he first assumed power in the country back in 2000. And yet, here he continues to stay in power in the Kremlin regardless. With a sky-high approval rating recorded by the Independent Levada Center as recently as July of 2023 at 82% of the Russian public. A fact that makes any popular protest, let alone a popular revolution against him taking place in Russia, seem exceedingly unlikely to happen anytime soon. By contrast, Putin currently enjoys vastly more public approval in Russia right now than nearly any other world leader does, with Joe Biden, Justin Trudeau, Rishi Sunak, Emmanuel Macron, and Fumio Kishida all falling significantly behind him. Arguably, the only world leader with more public approval right now than Putin is Volodymyr Zelensky, who enjoys an overwhelming 91% support in Ukraine. But not only is Putin still in power more than 18 months into the invasion of Ukraine and just as popular with the Russian public as ever, but nearly all domestic opposition against him appears to have been crushed as well. The anti-war protests that flared up across the country in early 2022 were relentlessly repressed, with nearly 20,000 Russians getting arrested and detained by the authorities and hundreds of thousands of others fleeing the country altogether. Alexei Navalny, often seen as the face of the Russian opposition to Putin in the West, has already been sentenced to 30 years in a Siberian penal colony on charges of alleged fraud and extremism, and is facing additional charges of alleged terrorism still to come. At 47 years old as of the making of this video, Navalny will likely spend the rest of his life in prison unless the still popular Putinist regime comes to an end first. Not only does Russia continue to occupy about a fifth of Ukraine's internationally recognized territory, an area about the same size as Austria, but the Russian economy and Russian society in general both so far seem to have barely even noticed the effects of the war and Putin's decision-making processes. After the invasion first began, Western policymakers in the US, EU, UK, and elsewhere all agreed on burying the Russian Federation beneath an unprecedented amount of financial sanctions that would supposedly lead to the complete financial Armageddon for the country. There were officials within the Biden administration who genuinely predicted that these sanctions, dubbed the most consequential in world history, would result in a complete meltdown of the Russian economy by as much as 50%. But against nearly all of these Western expectations and predictions of immediate financial catastrophe for Moscow, by the end of 2022, the Russian economy had only contracted by a fairly modest 2.1%. 
quote, a lower amount than the Russian economy shrank during the COVID-19 pandemic, or the 2009 global financial crisis, or across the 1990s, when the country was fumbling through its economic transition from the old Soviet system. And perhaps even more astonishingly, the IMF now expects that the Russian economy will return back to growth in 2023 and see an expansion of as much as 1.5%, with continued growth taking place next year in 2024, effectively undoing all of the economic shrinkage that happened in 2022. And simultaneously to these economic signs, millions of Russian civilians are continuing to vacation abroad as well. Nearly 7 million Russian tourists are expected just to visit Turkey this year alone, which is nearly 5% of the entire Russian population visiting just this single country, while millions more are visiting other popular destinations in Egypt, the UAE, the Maldives, and Thailand as well. And they're continuing to be flown largely on government-seized Boeing and Airbus aircraft operated by Russian-owned airlines. This is hardly the picture of the financial Armageddon for Russia that was originally painted by the West a year and a half ago as supposedly being inevitable. And it sits in extremely stark contrast to the extreme battering that the Ukrainian economy has suffered. After losing a fifth of its territory to a hostile foreign invasion, witnessing millions of its citizens leaving the country and tens of thousands more getting killed, and after suffering repeated missile, drone, and rocket attacks that have destroyed swaths of its infrastructure and suffering beneath a withering Russian naval blockade, choking off its exports and imports, the Ukrainian economy crashed by an estimated 29.1% by the end of 2022. Again, compared to only a 2.1% decline experienced in Russia. It is now increasingly becoming apparent that the financial war between the Western world and Russia is effectively devolving into a stalemate. A stalemate that is also increasingly reflecting the military stalemate taking place on the battlefield in Ukraine, as the ongoing Ukrainian counteroffensive is bogging down and struggling to break through the Russian front lines. And in order for you to understand how Putin and Russia have both managed to hang on this whole time, despite the massive sanctions and isolation placed upon them by the West, in addition to the massive losses of hundreds of thousands of military casualties in Ukraine, and why in nearly every aspect this conflict in Eastern Europe is dragging into a stalemate right now, it helps to understand where the source of Russia's modern power comes from in the first place, and how that power is being used. You see, as the biggest country in the world by terms of land, Russia contains within its vast territory an enormous amount of the resources and raw materials that modern developing civilizations all around the world need to continue functioning. Within the lands of Russia, you will find about a fourth of all the world's discovered reserves of natural gas, the absolute largest amount of natural gas reserves that any one single country possesses, along with the second largest reserves of coal and the sixth largest reserves of oil. Since Russia's population and economy are both fairly small relative to many of its neighbors across Eurasia like China, Japan, and Germany, the Russians themselves can never hope to consume all of these raw materials on their own. And that means that historically, the Russians have been by far the world's largest exporter of natural gas and the second largest exporter of oil, currently just barely behind the Saudis in first place. And these massive, globally significant exports of oil and gas have brought the Russian state both vast revenues and immense leverage over the foreign countries that depend on continuing receiving them. It got to such a point that immediately before the invasion of Ukraine in January of 2022, the oil and gas sector in Russia was accounting for a whopping 45% of the entire government's annual budget, and as much as 60% of all the state's exports. Oil and gas are Russia, and Russia is consequently the only true petrostate that exists in Europe, a country about as dependent on selling those resources to keep their government going as Saudi Arabia or Iran. Before the war, Russia made most of its fortune by selling these oil and gas resources to the various wealthy but energy resource poor countries of Western Europe. It was a relationship bound by geography and a mutual interest in what the other had. Western European countries had a lot of money, but virtually no domestic oil or gas, while Russia didn't have a lot of money, but had almost limitless amounts of oil and gas reserves that could be delivered to Europe more inexpensively than from anywhere else, through a series of direct overland pipelines that were painstakingly constructed across the decades. Throughout 2021, approximately half of all the oil that Russia exported abroad went westwards to Europe. About 45% of the entire European Union's natural gas imports were delivered by Russia, and the EU and UK collectively paid the Russians about $148 billion for these resources that single year alone. But immediately after the Russians ordered hundreds of thousands of troops storming into Ukraine in early 2022, the Western world announced that the days of Russia selling oil and gas to them were at an end. 
By the end of 2022, Russian energy exports to the EU, UK, and US were all either completely eliminated altogether or severely reduced in scale, with the aim of depriving the Russian government of funds it needed to continue waging the war in Ukraine. The U.S. eliminated all of its own fairly small imports of oil and gas from Russia almost immediately after the invasion began, while the European Union, traditionally Moscow's largest market for energy exports, had to take a little longer in order to adjust. Nonetheless, they still banned virtually all seaborne Russian oil imports by the end of 2022, and reduced Russia's share of its natural gas imports from around 45% immediately before the invasion to below 10% by the start of 2023. In order to replace the enormous amounts of suddenly lost Russian oil and gas, the European Union acquired additional piped gas coming in from sources like Norway, Algeria, and Azerbaijan, combined with vastly increased amounts of seaborne LNG imports from Qatar and the United States, who since replaced Russia as Europe's largest single natural gas provider. By the end of 2023, Russian natural gas exports to the European Union are projected to hit an effective rate of zero, violently symbolized by the mysterious bombings of the twin Nord Stream pipelines running beneath the Baltic Sea, directly between Germany and Russia that took place in late 2022, rendering Russia's largest direct pipeline project to Europe that cost more than $20 billion to construct completely useless. The very, very long energy for money relationship between Russia and Europe thus ended with a dramatic bang. Going even further, however, the Western world knew that the Russians could and would likely just divert much of their energy resources to other markets after getting locked out of Europe and North America. The dilemma that the West faced here, though, was that they couldn't possibly afford to just completely block the Russians from being able to do this. If their sanctions on Russian energy exports were too tight and completely restricted Russia's ability to sell any other oil and gas to anyone, then, yes, 45% of Russia's government budget would immediately get blown up and their ability to fund the war in Ukraine would be crippled. But it would also mean that Russia's massive contribution of 11% of the entire world's oil production would just be completely removed from the entire outside world supply, which would have resulted in a global supply shock of catastrophic proportions and sent the global price of oil spiraling even higher than it already was, resulting in even worse inflation for countries all around the world, since nearly every company in the world depends on oil for at least some part of their overall operations. And the higher oil costs go, the higher companies have to raise their prices in order to offset those higher costs. So, in order to encourage Russia to continue exporting their oil onto the world market to keep the global supply of oil steady, while simultaneously cutting into their potential revenues earned from selling that oil that would go towards financing their war in Ukraine, the G7 nations consisting of the United States, Canada, the European Union, United Kingdom, and Japan, plus Australia, all introduced what's called a price cap sanction on Russian oil. Under this sanction, maritime service companies involved in things like insurance, shipping, logistics, and finances, operating within the G7 countries plus Australia, are allowed to continue helping move Russian oil and petroleum products around the world, but only if they are purchased beneath the targeted price cap set by the coalition right now, of $60 a barrel, well beneath the average global benchmark price, which has averaged between $70 and $82 per barrel all throughout 2023. This is important because the G7 countries plus Australia are home to about 90% of the relevant maritime insurance and services companies operating in the world. And basically every single port and major canal anywhere in the world requires ships using them to have legitimate insurance in order to proceed. So, basically, if Russian companies exporting oil or third-party companies anywhere in the world want to import Russian oil, and they want continued access to mainstream Western insurance and services companies to do so, Russia has no other choice but to sell the oil used in these transactions at or beneath the below market rate price cap. And moreover, even if other countries don't want to use the Western world's insurance and services, the mere existence of the price cap grants them an amount of leverage to negotiate lower prices from Russia on their own. Because what alternative do the Russians really even have? More than halfway through 2023, the price cap sanctions appear to be working about exactly as intended. Russian oil exports to the world market remained more or less consistent, keeping the global supply steady, while their revenue was continually diminishing at the same time. Over the first half of 2023, from January to June, Moscow only earned about $37.4 billion on their oil sales to foreign markets, less than half of what they had earned during the first half of 2022. Becoming increasingly locked out of the European and North American markets altogether, and constrained in every other market by the price cap sanction, the Russians were also forced to almost completely reroute all of their oil and gas exports to countries across Asia and Africa instead, 
Before the invasion of Ukraine, a lot of this trade didn't really make economic sense because of geography. European states are wealthy, and their economic centers are located far closer to Russia's oil and gas resource locations than major Asian or African economic centers, meaning that Russian energy exports were much more economical to ship to Europe, while the Persian Gulf's energy resources were much more economical to ship to South and East Asia and Africa. For context, before the invasion began, it cost an average of about $6 to ship a barrel of Russian oil to China, but only $3 to ship a barrel of Persian Gulf oil from a place like Saudi Arabia to China. And thus, East Asia imported most of their oil from the Persian Gulf, while Europe imported most of their oil from places like Russia and Norway. But the Ukraine invasion and the Western price gap changed all of that, as Russia became forced into selling their oil for massive discounts onto the world market, to the tune of $20 less per barrel than the global benchmark which greatly encouraged more neutral countries to start gobbling up their significantly cheaper supplies. That suddenly overshadowed their relatively more expensive shipping costs. India literally went from purchasing hardly any Russian oil at all before the invasion, to increasing their purchases by more than 10 times over, to the point where right now in late 2023, a whopping 40% of India's oil imports are all being purchased from Russia. In the process, the Saudis, who were supplying the Indian market with about 20% of their oil imports right before the invasion, have seen their market share diminish to only about 13% today. Simultaneously to that, China roughly doubled their purchases of Russian oil from the start of the invasion to May of 2023, as Russian oil suddenly out of the blue became even cheaper for them than Persian Gulf oil, which has led to an unexpectedly fierce competition erupting for the Chinese energy market, the largest energy market in the world between the two biggest energy exporters, the Saudis and the Russians. Before the Ukraine invasion, the Chinese imported 21% of their oil from Saudi Arabia, and only 8.8% of their oil from Russia, which has since flipped to 14.5% of their oil from Saudi Arabia, and 14% from Russia, with the Russians being projected to even overtake the Saudis as China's newest largest oil provider by the end of the year. This is all very complicated for relations between the Saudis and the Russians, because as the Russians take up more of the oil market in places like India and China, the less oil the Indians and Chinese are buying from the Saudis. Which means the Saudis are earning fewer dollars to fund their ambitious and critical Vision 2030 reforms. In order to compensate for Saudi Arabia's lost market shares in Asia and the West's price cap on Russian oil, both of which are hurting Russian and Saudi oil revenues, the two countries have begun jointly agreeing to cut their oil production levels throughout 2023, to try and reduce their usually massive supplies of oil to the global market in order to raise the global price of oil, which will forcefully increase their own oil revenues in the process to offset Saudi Arabia's declining market shares and the enforced price caps set on Russia. By September of 2023, Saudi Arabia is expected to have cut their production to only 9 million barrels of oil a day, while Russia is expected to cut down to a similar 9.1 million barrels per day, about 2 million barrels a day less than they each were producing last year in 2022. And in order to push back against them a bit, the United States is expected to increase oil production to an all-time record in 2023 of 12.6 million barrels per day, which is a deliberate attempt to try and offset the inflationary pressures caused by the Russians and the Saudis decreasing their productions. The result is that a global oil war is being fought between the Americans and the Europeans on one side, who want lower oil prices both to tame inflation and to hurt the Russian war machine in Ukraine, and the Russians and Saudis on the other side, who want higher oil prices for very different, but nonetheless momentarily aligned reasons. Russia wants more money to fight in Ukraine and stabilize their economy, while the Saudis want more money to fund their multi-trillion dollar economic and societal reforms. Ultimately, Russia is still managing to sell large amounts of its oil and gas resources to neutral countries like China, India, Turkey, and even non-neutral entities like the European Union. Though the amount that the Europeans have bought this year is about four times less than the amount they purchased last year, and is continuing to decline further towards zero as Europe continues finding alternative supplies elsewhere. And even though Russia is selling these oil and gas resources for less than they used to, their tactics of coordinating joint oil supply cuts with the Saudis are steadily contributing to a pumping 
speeding up of the global price of oil, which is enabling the Russians to sell their own oil for higher rates as well. Since June of 2023, the trading price of Russian oil has even managed to break through the G7 Plus Australia enforced price cap. And as of the writing of this video, it has managed to even surpass $70 a barrel, still beneath the global average, but well above the targeted price cap, and well above what Russian oil was trading at between January and June of 2023. Meaning that the Russians are probably going to be earning more on their oil revenues in the second half of 2023 than they did during the first half. In anticipation of these higher oil revenues in the future, the Russian government recently announced a dramatic increase to their defense spending in August of 2023, to more than 5% of their total GDP, pushing the Russian military's budget to more than $100 billion a year now, the third highest in the world only behind China and the United States, and roughly a third of the Chinese defense budget. This is the highest the Russian defense budget has ever been pushed to since the Soviet era, and it symbolizes that Russia is increasingly shifting towards a wartime economy. Ukraine is as well, of course, to an even higher degree than Russia. Ukrainian defense spending as of 2023 has shot up to 18.3% of their GDP, which is the third highest in the entire world as an overall percentage, remaining only behind the militaristic and totalitarian states of North Korea and Eritrea. That is giving the Ukrainians an annual defense budget of more than $30 billion to work with, in addition to more than $100 billion worth of gifted military aid given to them by countries abroad, $60 billion of which has all come from the United States alone. That is giving both the Ukrainians and the Russians similar amounts of budgets to work with during the war, despite Ukraine's vastly smaller population, industrial, and economic base relative to Russia. Massive industrial output for the war effort within Russia is being funneled towards goods like uniforms, small arms, ammunition, artillery, vehicles, missiles, drones, helicopters and planes, and expanding jobs and demand in the process. It is, in large part, this enormous government spending on the war effort, in addition to the rising oil prices that is giving the overall Russian economy its momentary boost, in a phenomenon that has been dubbed by some as military Keynesianism. A massive boost to industrial demand within Russia, benefiting the Russian military-industrial complex and war beneficiaries. Simultaneously along this government-paid-for stimulus in the industrial sector, however, are further government stimulus programs to increase pensions, salaries, and subsidized mortgages for millions of everyday Russians. Russian soldiers fighting in the war are currently being paid vastly higher wages than they otherwise could earn back at home in poorer areas of the country. In September of 2022, it was reported that Russian soldiers were earning a minimum of $1,740 a month in pay, a whopping three times more than the national average monthly wage in Russia. Moreover, families of soldiers killed in the war have allegedly been receiving payments of as much as $52,000 by the government, more than three and a half times the average annual salary in the country. The result has been a flood of cash into the economy and a boost in demand and prices for just about everything in the country, which is, at least for the moment, managing to keep the country's economy humming along mostly as usual. But you might obviously be asking, if Russia's oil and gas revenues have been cut so severely, and those revenues used to make up 45% of the Russian government's budget before the invasion of Ukraine, then where is Russia getting all of this money to expand the defense budget and pay out all of these higher salaries and pensions and subsidies? And the answer is that they simply aren't getting any extra money, and the government is instead deciding to just run at a historic deficit to keep the payments going for as long as possible, in the hopes that the oil and gas revenues eventually begin to recover and the deficit steadily goes away, which, as of the writing of this video, they appear to actually be doing. Up to May of 2023, the Russian government was projected to finish the year with a budget deficit of approximately $41 billion. And more recent Russian government data factoring in rising oil prices projects this deficit to end the year at only $28 billion. And neither of those are particularly catastrophic because Russia's entire national debt, as of July 2023 denominated in US dollars, is only $250.8 billion, which is only equivalent to about 15% of the entire Russian annual GDP. From a total debt as a percentage of GDP perspective, Russia has by far the lowest amount of outstanding debt out of any of the top 20 economies in the world, and has a substantially lower percentage of debt than any of the G7 economies do. Assuming no further dramatic crashes to the Russian economy, Russia could literally run at these deficit levels for about half a century until it began approaching similar debt levels as the United States currently experiences. But there are potential cracks just beneath the surface of the Russian economy that could still end up causing problems. And there's further 
further concerns about Russia's extremely tight labor force and chronic worker shortage, a problem that the state has very few methods of actually solving. Russia's population was already in a state of terminal decline before the invasion even began, and Putin's decision to mobilize 300,000 additional men in September 2022, mostly from the blue-collar sector of the economy to fight in Ukraine, has removed even more workers from the economy. Add on to that the estimated hundreds of thousands of other Russians who have fled the country ever since the invasion began and the worker shortage has become even more pronounced. And Russia is struggling to replace those lost workers with migrants because the Western sanctions are restricting those migrants' ability to send their earned wages back home. This is why it will be very difficult for Russia to mobilize any additional men for the war in Ukraine. They certainly could, but doing so would greatly harm the economy by removing even more workers from an already very tight labor force. Not to even mention, it would be potentially politically destabilizing as well. So, while seemingly stable right now, further casualties suffered in Ukraine resulting in further rounds of mobilization pulling more workers out from the economy could begin causing the system to eventually break down through simply running out of labor. But for now, the Russian economy seems remarkably stable and resilient given all of the circumstances. As it turns out, attempting to completely remove a country as geographically large and as resource-rich as Russia from the entire world economy is, obviously, a very difficult task. Consider the existence of the Eurasian Economic Union, basically Russia's version of the European Union whose member states all maintain free trade agreements between them without any border customs or trade barriers. Russia and Belarus are both under massive Western financial sanctions, but Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Armenia all are not. That means that those three countries can all import valuable things from the West that Russia cannot. Things like advanced semiconductors, computer chips, and lasers, and then discreetly sell them for a fortune to Russia. In addition to Chinese and Turkish companies basically doing the same thing, Russia is still acquiring many of the advanced chips and lasers that it needs to continue supplying its army in Ukraine with. And at the same time, Russian seized Boeing and Airbus aircraft operating for Russian-owned airlines are still flying millions of Russian tourists all across the world. And many of them are continuing to receive maintenance, parts, and repairs while they're out in neutral countries like Turkey, Egypt, and the United Arab Emirates. In order to fully stop all of it, Western sanctions and sanctions compliance ultimatums will have to be greatly expanded, which has the potential to obviously alienate important neutral countries like Turkey, China, Kazakhstan, and the United Arab Emirates. Fully sanctioning a country as geographically enormous as Russia, with as many massive volumes of natural resources as Russia, that the developing world needs to survive is a very, very difficult task indeed, and maybe ultimately impossible. And thus, you have this developing stalemate emerging in both the energy war and the economic war between the West and Russia, wherein Russia's economy is seemingly barely being affected. And so Putin's popularity is barely being affected as well by proxy. And it's all increasingly reflecting the military stalemate taking place on the battlefield in Ukraine as well. It is the publicly stated goal of the Ukrainian government to retake all of its lost territory prior to 2014, including the Crimean Peninsula. But in order to do so, they must break through a front line across the east of their country that now stretches for more than a thousand kilometers, in which the Russians have spent months and months building up their defenses across. They have tirelessly built extensive trenches, ditches, dragon's teeth, and, most notably of all, planted an unbelievable number of landmines. Both Ukrainian and Russian forces alike have planted landmines across the country during this conflict to block potential attack routes, but it's gotten to the point now where nobody even knows how many there are in the country. There's estimates floating around out there of there being literally millions of landmines that have been planted across an area in Ukraine that's about the size of Florida, which means that Ukraine is almost certainly one of the most heavily landmine-contaminated countries on the planet now. This will likely take generations and tens of billions of dollars worth of effort to clean up by whoever and up controlling the land whenever, if ever, the hostilities of the war finally conclude. But in the meantime, the Ukrainian counteroffensive is struggling immensely to break through the thick minefields and well-prepared defenses of the Russians. Ordinarily, this would be countered by concentrating an overwhelming amount of airstrikes across a section of the minefields and defenses to blow them up, so that the Ukrainian forces on the ground could then plow their way through and make a run into lands in the rear that aren't as well defended, and then flank the defenders from behind. But the Ukrainians hardly have an air force at all, and so they simply don't have the air superiority to do this kind of operation. So, they have no other choice but to do it the hard way, and attack the defenses on the ground without any effective air support. That is going to be a very slow and grinding process that will entail very heavy casualties, and there's no way around it. 
but they have no other choice if they want to try and take back all of their lost territories. Because the only way they can win this war is by continuing to receive tens of billions of dollars worth of military aid and equipment from the Western democracies. Left on their own right now, Ukraine likely wouldn't stand a chance against Russia. Ukraine's demographic profile is vastly worse than even Russia's, and the rate of their population decline since the collapse of the Soviet Union is unprecedented in contemporary history. Immediately after the Soviet Union collapsed, Ukraine hit its peak historic population in 1993 of about 52.4 million people, and it has declined literally every single year ever since then by an average of more than 300,000 people a year. By 2021, right before the invasion, it had shrunk to fewer than 41.2 million people, more than 10 million less than it existed back in 1993. And since the invasion happened in 2022, when millions fled the country as refugees, and swaths of territory were lost, it's believed that Ukraine's population remaining under the government's control has crashed even further to only a little more than 36 million people right now, smaller than the population of Poland and a catastrophic loss of one-third of the population from only 30 years ago. This is in comparison to an estimated 145 million Russians who remain in their country and occupy territories, only slightly down from the Russian peak population seen in 1992 of 148.5 million. In theory, Russia has around 47 million men fit for military service, with around 1.3 million additional men reaching military age every single year, while Ukraine may only have around 15 million men fit for military service and only 480,000 reaching military age every year. Meaning that Russia theoretically possesses a roughly 3 to 1 advantage in available manpower to pull from for the war effort. And ominously, right now, it's believed by American intelligence that the Russians have at least 320,000 troops deployed to the front line in Ukraine, significantly more than the mere 190,000 they initially used to invade the country with back in February 2022. It's believed that Ukraine has around 700,000 active troops operating right now, but in order for the best odds at defeating the Russians during an attack, where they are likely to suffer higher casualty rates, they need to find a place where they outnumber them by at least 3 to 1 while they overall only outnumber them by about 2 to 1 across the entire front line. And Russia can much better replace their manpower losses than Ukraine can. And then there's the matter of Ukraine's financial and industrial potential relative to the Russians as well. Since the invasion began, Ukraine exploded their defense spending levels to a completely unprecedented $44 billion for the fiscal year of 2022, more than seven times higher than their defense budget had been the previous year before the invasion in 2021. After considering that the Ukrainian GDP crashed by about 30% during 2022 because of the invasion, Ukrainian defense spending for the year reached just over 27% of their total GDP. P, a rate that is in line with an old-school total war-style economy, and the highest percentage of GDP spent on defense of any country in the world currently as of 2023. For context, between 1989 and 2021, the average total annual government budget of Ukraine was only $18.7 billion. And in 2021, the year immediately before the Russian invasion, the government budget was a little higher in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic at $36.1 billion. This means that in both 2022 and now in 2023, the Ukrainian government is spending more on its military alone than the entire combined national budget of the whole country was back in 2021. And it's no wonder why. This war is an existential threat to Ukraine's very survival as an independent state. And if they lose the war, Ukraine itself may fall in its entirety to the Russian Federation. But as a result of the massive increase to defense spending combined with massive losses to its exports, and no prior ability to sell large volumes of critical resources like oil and gas like the Russians have, Ukraine is currently projected to run a historic deficit for 2023 of about $40 billion, most of which will end up being covered by Ukraine's foreign allies in the United States, Europe, and the IMF. Ukraine's Western allies have already given the country more than $100 billion worth of direct military aid, equipment, and assistance since the invasion began. $60 billion of which has all come from the United States alone, an amount that when adjusted for inflation is still even more than the United States collectively gave to the Mujahideen forces fighting against the Soviets all throughout the entirety of the 1980s. Ukraine's massive shift to a total war-style economy with a military budget equivalent to over a quarter of its entire GDP, and this 
$100 billion in further military aid given to it from abroad has been putting the Ukrainian armed forces on about an even pairing with the Russian armed forces from a budgetary perspective. Despite Ukraine's vastly smaller population, industrial, and economic base relative to Russia left all on its own. But questions linger about Ukraine's ultimate ability to actually sustain all of this. For example, the Ukrainian government doesn't really know what it's going to do next year to sustain its all-time record budget deficit and record high military spending should the war continue. And should the Americans and Europeans start reducing their support? Once you consider that tens of billions of dollars of damage have been dealt to Ukraine's infrastructure by nearly constant Russian missile, drone, and artillery attacks over these past 18 months, combined with the tens of billions of dollars it'll take to clear out all of the landmines, and other unexploded ordnance combined with other miscellaneous costs, and you arrive at a World Bank estimated price tag of $350 billion to fully rebuild Ukraine once the war has eventually concluded. Included. Well over double what the entire Ukrainian GDP has crashed to since the invasion began. Add on to the fact that as a result of its massive military spending and resulting record deficits, the Ukrainian national debt has also more than doubled from its pre-invasion levels to approximately $162 billion today in mid-late 2023, about equivalent to the country's entire annual GDP right now. Even if ultimately victorious in the war, left on its own, Ukraine couldn't possibly afford to pay the $350 billion price tag required to rebuild itself after the war, as doing so would easily make it by far the most heavily indebted country in the entire world, with a debt-to-GDP ratio that would approach 320%, which would nearly guarantee a Ukrainian default on at least a part of its debt. Ukraine needs somebody else to pay for the rebuilding of the country following the war's conclusion, whether it comes from punitive war reparations from Russia, further aid from the West, or a combination of both, it does not matter. But the funds simply don't exist within Ukraine to do so on their own, especially not as their massive budget deficit continues ballooning the debt even further the longer the war continues. And remember that Russia's current debt-to-GDP levels and budget deficits are only a fraction of Ukraine's, meaning that at current levels, Russia can easily outlast Ukraine financially during this war of attrition. The only factor that's been saving Ukraine from complete financial catastrophe so far has been the more than $160 billion worth of combined military, financial, and humanitarian aid that has been given to them by date by the United States, the European Union, United Kingdom, Japan, Canada, and Norway nearly half of which has all come from just the United States. If Ukraine ever loses this massive flow of equipment and aid coming in from the West in the future, then their own domestic manpower, financial, and industrial base will never be able to match the Russians' manpower, financial, and industrial base, and they will almost certainly lose any long, grinding war of attrition as a result. Ukraine has to try and break through the well-prepared Russian defensive lines now, as soon as they can, because if they wait and do nothing, or are shown to be incapable of breaking through the Russian defenses, then the West may end up losing confidence in Ukraine's ability to defeat the Russians, and the tens of billions of dollars worth of their equipment and aid will gradually cease coming in. Continuing to send tens of billions of dollars of equipment to Ukraine is certainly going to become a hot political issue within the United States during the 2024 presidential election, as a recent poll from CNN found that a majority of 55% of Americans now oppose sending any more funding to Ukraine with Republicans significantly more opposed to continuing the aid than Democrats, and with both frontrunners for the Republican nomination openly stating their desires to end America's financial support for Ukraine. This is the cold calculus that the Ukrainian and Russian militaries are both currently working with. Ukraine must throw its troops against the well-prepared Russian defenses despite not having the necessary equipment to do it properly, and will inevitably suffer high casualties in the process because if they don't break through, policy in the United States may change against them, and their financial lifeline may get cut off. And so the Russians are increasing defense spending and running their own budget deficit, and sitting still in their well-prepared defenses, letting the Ukrainians attack them, because they are banking on this exact scenario eventually taking place. The Ukrainians failing to break through the tough defenses on the front lines, and America growing frustrated and impatient with the lack of results, while her primary focus is an entire world away on China, Taiwan, and Asia, resulting in America eventually winding down their direct support for Ukraine. After which, the Russians will inevitably return back 
back to the attack again, with recovering oil prices giving them fresh windfalls to pad their budget with. The Russian playbook is thus to draw this all out into as long, bloody, and costly a stalemate as physically possible until public support for continuing supporting the fight in the West gradually runs out just like it did previously during America's experiences in Vietnam and Afghanistan. And when it comes to hopes for further instability and uprisings happening in Russia against the increasing costs of the war, they don't seem to really be materializing despite the best hopes for one by governments in the West. This is despite the fact that Russia has likely suffered at least 65,000 of its soldiers killed and another 150,000 wounded so far during the whole invasion of Ukraine literally more military deaths than Russia has collectively suffered in every single other war it has fought in since 1945 combined, and more deaths than the United States suffered during the entirety of the Vietnam War. Russia has a very long history of catastrophic losses in wars just like this one, leading to revolutions that tore apart the state. Like how catastrophic losses during World War I led to revolution in 1917 that destroyed the Tsarist Russian Empire. Or how catastrophic losses and stalemate in Afghanistan all throughout the 1980s contributed, in part, to the final dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. Many have speculated that this devastating experience in Ukraine today in the 21st century could lead to a similar revolution and dissolution of the modern Russian Federation in a similar fashion as these historic examples. But the thing that this speculation often misses out on is that the modern Russian Federation is substantially less diverse of a place than it used to be during all of those previous collapses. The 1897 census on the Russian Empire revealed that only 44% of the empire's population at the time were Russians, meaning that ethnic and nationalist-based separatist movements in the far-flung parts of the empire were far easier to be successful against the Russians. The 1989 census in the Soviet Union revealed that only 51% of the Soviet population at the time were Russians. Again, meaning that ethnic and nationalist-based separatist movements in the far-flung parts of the Soviet Empire were far more likely to be successful against the Russians. But now in the 21st century, the 2021 census in the Russian Federation revealed that 81% of the population are ethnically Russian, meaning that Russia in its current form in the 21st century is substantially more of a nation-state than the hyper-polyglot empires that it used to be during previous collapses. In fact, there's only 12 administrative divisions within Russia today where ethnic Russians are even a minority. And in eight of them, they are fairly significantly sized minorities. There are only four administrative divisions within Russia where ethnic Russians are a pretty insignificant minority, and the only three of them that matter with significant histories of ethnic separatism are all located in the South Caucasus. Dagestan, Chechnya, and Ingushetia. Surely, if things get bad enough for Russia and Putin is toppled from power somehow, these three areas with long histories of wars and separatism from Russia as recently as the 2000s may once again try at declaring their independence. But imagining that anywhere else in Russia will try and do the same, especially as Putin continues maintaining an overall approval rating as high as 82% seems fairly unthinkable. But that isn't to say that a full-blown civil war happening within Russia is completely impossible. If the price of oil unexpectedly collapses in the future, the Russian government may struggle to continue on with its ongoing budget deficits and stimulus spending keeping the economy running. If Russia suffers vastly increased casualty rates in Ukraine and has to order new rounds of mobilization calling up hundreds of thousands of additional Russians, then even more workers get pulled from the already very tight labor force and the Russian economy begins simply running out of people to fill up available jobs with, resulting in an eventual economic slowdown, and the West could always hypothetically expand their sanctions further to try and clamp down on all the neutral countries providing the Russians with loopholes. These hypothetical future outcomes would result in the Russian economy taking a bad turn, and all of them combined, a very bad turn. And combined with heavy human losses in Ukraine, Putin's popularity may begin to falter. Prigozhin rather foolishly launched his own rebellion before any of these preconditions had been met, however. The Russian economy was still doing fine. Putin's approval rating was at 81%, and he still decided to take his chances swinging anyway. At least for 24 hours before he likely realized that his entire organization was about to be completely destroyed. 
The Wagner rebellion he unleashed, indeed, could have destabilized a part of Russia's internal political machinations, but nobody from the outside world truly understands how the system of rule within Russia that Putin has carefully crafted over his 23 years in power actually works. But we do know that at least one major rebellion has already taken place under circumstances that seemed pretty good for Putin. If the economic and military circumstances change in the future, then what outcome does that pretend? But Prigozhin only launched his rebellion in the context of horrendous difficulties and catastrophic losses that his forces and the Russians in general were suffering during the enormous battle for Bakhmut in the east of Ukraine. For over a year now to the present day, the Russians in the Wagner Group on one side and the Ukrainians on the other have each thrown tens of thousands of their soldiers and hundreds of their tanks into a fierce battle for control over the city in a development that has been compared to the scale and intensity of the Battle of Verdun fought during World War I. A historical analogy made even more acute by the fighting around Bakhmut quickly devolving into attritional trench warfare than most Europeans thought they would never see happen on their continent ever again. The ongoing battle being fought here has since become the biggest and the most historically important battle fought in Europe since the Second World War, and the final outcome of it has the potential to determine the trajectory of the entire war and indeed the entire future of Ukraine and Eastern Europe at large. But unfortunately, due to the inherently violent, controversial, and recent nature of discussing a major, ongoing battle in Europe that has already claimed tens of thousands of human lives on both sides condemned to fighting it, the next part of this video that would cover it would almost certainly cause the rest of the video before it to become demonetized and age-restricted, which ultimately would mean that YouTube's algorithm would never have promoted any of this video to you and you probably never would have seen any of it. But thankfully, I was still able to produce the next part of this video anyway because of the power of Nebula, where you can go and watch the next 40-minute part covering how the battle for Bakhmut still being waged between Russia and Ukraine right now has evolved into the modern 21st century's flashback of Europe's darkest experiences from the two world wars. And this is also just one of more than two dozen exclusive full-length real-life lore videos that you can only find on Nebula in my overall Modern Conflict series there that can all only be found found over there because of all of their darker, more controversial subject material. There are other episodes you can go and watch right now, like these four previous episodes, covering the greater scope and timeline of the ongoing war in Ukraine from 2014 to the present day. These episodes covering previous Russian wars and interventions fought in Chechnya, Georgia, and Syria. Or these episodes covering the recent international war against ISIS deeper dives into the civil wars waged in Yemen, Libya, and Syria, and dozens of others with brand new episodes releasing over there every single month. And what's even more, you also get access to all of the other amazing exclusive content on Nebula, because the best part about this site is that it's jointly co-owned by all of its creators, built by me and hundreds of other YouTubers and podcasters alike. And because it's a subscription-based service, we all get to work on way bigger and higher budget productions over there than we ever could do on YouTube. That's why there's tons of other exclusive content you'll find there that's equally fascinating from all of these other creators over there as well. And if you sign up for Nebula using my link, you'll also get free access to all of Nebula classes, where creators host classes on how to be, well, a creator. There's classes by Sam from Wendover Productions on persuasive communication, or by Devin from Legal Eagle on copyright laws, or by Patrick Willems on how to make a movie, and dozens of others. All of which are great for aspiring future creators or anyone who just wants a peek behind the curtain. And, best of all, if you sign up by clicking the button that's here on your screen right now or by following the link down below in the description, you'll receive an insane 40% discount for an annual subscription, which means it'll only cost you two and a half dollars a month for all of this awesome exclusive content from myself and hundreds of other independent creators, with even newer stuff coming out every single month. It's the absolute best way to help support what I'm doing here on Real Life Lore, and as always, thank you so much for watching.